Carolyn. Precisely. Thank you, Andreas. And thank you to the um, organizers for allowing me to present some thoughts about standard setting in the context of regulatory harmonization. And from what I just heard from Mike, it seems that we might even think of standards as the centerpiece for regulatory convergence. And this would be from the standpoint of my institute, the Critical Path Institute, which is a nonprofit um, public-private partnership with the FDA and regulatory convergence is an idea to which we are deeply committed. And in fact, we exist as an organization to address this challenge, the unacceptable and unsustainable time and cost that it takes to bring new drugs to market when patients are waiting. It now takes over a decade and exceeds a billion dollars to bring one new drug to market. And last February in a, an issue of Forbes, it was even estimated that the real cost may be closer to four to 11 billion dollars per new drug. So clearly the process is broken and process improvement solutions will require collaborative approaches that include both the public, the regulatory, uh, bodies and the private sectors in industry and academia and that those are the sectors that CPAF brings together um, but these these solutions must also be applicable on a global level because this is a global industry as previous speakers have pointed out and throughout the domestic and global drug development enterprise, both within a single company and, and certainly between companies, there's a lot of heterogeneity, um, lack of standards in the way things are done. Data to demonstrate efficacy and safety are defined and collected differently. Measurements of efficacy and safety are based on differing criteria. And methodologies for design of clinical trials for new drugs differ widely. So really, there is a fundamental need for global standards across the developmental and approvals procedures for regulated medical products. And, and it's, it's more or less easy on a um, conceptual level to recognize a good standard. A good standard is one that does save you time, money, and problems in the long run. And we have some examples of global standards that have achieved um, this status. Um, one would be in the financial industry where um, it, the, the possessor of a credit card or a bank card can go to any ATM machine anywhere in the world and extract money in the it converted from the currency of that country um, into U.S. dollars and get either currency um, at will. Um, a, an example of a less than good standard, of course, was pointed out by Bird, and, and we all experience this in international travel and are never quite sure if we have the right converters or plugs with us um, as, as we're traveling the world. Standards would, in fact, be at the center of process improvement for drug development, but they require certain foci that all, all of which must be achieved um, simultaneously in, in order to, um, at the end of the day, uh, get a good standard um, from the process. And, and that would be that these need to be um, widely accepted. There has to be wide spread consensus um, around these standards and widespread compliance. And usually consensus drives compliance. And that's one of the approaches that CPATH takes in generating standards. Widespread availability, they should be freely available and not proprietary and exclusionary. They should be cost effective in terms of their applicability and not the impossible dream to use. Um, they should be endorsed and enforced by authoritative sources. And in the case of drug development, this would be the regulators and the standards development organizations that work with the regulators to generate these standards. And of course, they must be globally applicable. And in the world of international business, which is the business of drug development. Um, as was previously pointed out, current technologies and modes of transportation actually erase international boundaries and allow companies of any size to market their products around the globe. But differing regulations and standards from country to country 
continue to this day to cause delays and create barriers and of course increase the costs of doing business. And in fact, a manufacturer may need to produce multiple versions of the very same product to distribute that product to countries where the standards and the regulations differ. But for medicines, differing standards and regulations are both medically and ethically unacceptable unless, of course, they are founded upon a scientific basis for doing so. Um, but just because the regulatory uh, boundaries are high is not a good reason to be manufacturing different flavors of the same medicine for different countries. So moving toward the use of international standards, it's clear that to be successful, there, there needs to be participation, um, harmonization, convergence of um, standards flowing from the combined work of standards development organizations, regulatory bodies, and industries which need to work together. And other industries beside the drug development industry um, have uh, led the way and have far exceeded uh, the drug development industry in achieving harmonization. And, and the other regulatory industries such as information technology, telecommunications and finance are really far ahead of drug development in this regard. And the international standards organizations that have grown up over the decades um, to address the lack of harmonization of, of regulation in the, those in industries are shown here. But the one at the top of the list was mentioned by Mike, the international um, uh, standard organization um, which really has um, existed for um, you said it was 1947 that so 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 clearly this is an organization that's been around for more than 60 years and from its website I, I borrowed its definition of a standard which is that it provides requirements specifications guidelines or characteristics that can be used consistently to ensure that products, materials, processes, and services are fit for their purpose. Now that would certainly apply to drug development. Um, and uh, they list as among the benefits of international standards that they ensure that products and services are safe, reliable, and of good quality. That also would apply directly to drug development. But I think on, on a, a more process-focused level, they are strategic tools that reduce costs by minimizing waste and errors and increasing productivity. And that, in a nutshell, is the focus of the Critical Path Institute. It functions as an orchestrator for the development of new tools, approaches, and standards that are created through collaboration of global companies and global scientists, reviewed and qualified by the FDA, also the EMA and PMDA, who have these review and qualification programs in place, and subsequently are released into the public domain and made available to the community. We develop uh, many flavors of standards, um, but the two main uh, standards categories within which we work are those of measurement standards and method standards. And what I mean by measurement standards are would, would include things like biomarkers for efficacy and patient classification. So these would be endpoints or patient selection. Biomarkers for toxicity, safety. Imaging biomarkers for efficacy and patient classification. Patient observer and clinician reported outcomes instruments when there is no biomolecule to measure in terms of efficacy. Or uh, regulatory qualification would be the end goal in terms of taking any of these measurement or method standards forward for formal regulatory approval. Recognition and approval for a given context of use, the way it's uh, applied uh, in the drug development pipeline is, is very important and is essential to demonstrate uh, to the regulators uh, in these qualification programs. These are formal programs um, that were 
um, developed since uh, 2006, first by the Food and Drug Administration in the United States, followed by the European Medicines Agency and the Pharmaceutical and Medical Devices Agency in Japan. But it is a rigorous process of review and acceptance of a scientific standard um, that once reviewed and accepted and, and, and uh, accorded qualification can then be used by any company to develop drugs with the assurance that the scientific basis of their data collection will be acceptable to the regulators. The way we do this is to act as a trusted neutral third party to bring to the table the best scientists from industry, academia, and government there's part, direct participation by scientists from the FDA in our process for pre-competitive sharing of data and expertise. This perforce ends in producing a standard based on the best science, the broadest experience, active consensus building, and shared risks and costs. So there are benefits just to the process of bringing people together to decide on a scientific standard based on current data. And it also, um, a, a, acting as a trusted third party, CPATH enables iterative FDA involvement in the development process in a legal fashion. There's, there's official uh, regulatory recognition through the qualification process at the end of the day. Um, this whole process is, uh, as, is extremely lengthy. There are multiple steps to this process, but the end result um, would be the, a worthy one of creating a compendium of standards from which the entire industry and regulators around the world could draw um, to assure that there is, in fact, um, uniform ways of doing things um, around the world, doing things that, for the same reason, the same way, the best way, every time. And having pre-reviewed that standard, there would be a sense of familiarity on the part of the regulators that would save them time when it came to product review um, of the data submitted for efficacy and safety. So we have our, um, our our collaborations organized into consortia that are usually focused on a single disease process or on a methodology such as patient reported outcomes instrument generation. We now have seven global consortia consisting of more than a thousand scientists and 41 companies around the world. This is really the who's who of Big Pharma. They all participate in, in um, one or more of our consortia. Uh, and bringing these partners together um, changes the culture of drug development um, just in the process of sharing, um, being able to uh, uh, provide a, a, an even playing field for these scientists from these companies to interact um, is already widening the pre-competitive space. The anticipated effects of this, of course, are that it will shorten the time, decrease the cost, and, de and decrease the risks of developing efficacious medical products and, and to create stronger scientific bases for decision making, um, both within the industry, making go and no go decisions and uh, decisions about bringing products forward for development as well as decisions about market approval on the part of the regulatory agencies. It engenders compliance through ownership. It's these companies own and these scientists own data that they're sharing. They have confidence in the data and in the process of reviewing each other's data on an even playing field, they have a sense of ownership that in fact um, it, it engenders compliance without having to regulate the use of these standards. And it also creates a, a public resource in the pre-competitive model um, for use globally um, by all uh, members of the uh, community. So uh, we see basically this process as, as uh, the, with the regulators in the center um, being the focus um, of approval for these standards as, as, 
being a centerpiece for creating efficiencies and, and open dialogue and data sharing um, among our, our participant companies. But in fact, the regulatory um, agencies do not themselves yet have a harmonized process for qualifying these standards. And this um, is a, 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 a chart that I borrowed from a chapter written by Federico Goodset in uh, last year um, that shows when um, these agencies that have qualification programs um, began. Um, they all are focused on regulatory review and acceptance. Some have fees and some do not. Um, there are a differing number of steps that the, uh, that, that the uh, standard sponsor uh, must go through in order to acquire qualification. There uh, is a difference in the length of the, the average length of the process. And the number of qualification decisions made to date, you can see, are modest. Um, although a single decision can cover as many as six or seven biomarkers. And although these qualifications um, decisions are few at this time, CPAP is the world's leader in, in successful qualification. So we have learned how to work with different inve in investigators as well as different regulatory bodies around the world um, to achieve this. But those are scientific standards. What about data standards? And I, I, this is as big a challenge as, as scientific standards in terms of uh, global harmonization and convergence. And I want to start out by saying that a data standard is not a common data element. So when you're doing a clinical trial and you're um, gathering uh, different uh, pieces of information, a common data element to all case report forms might be the date of birth of the patient or the gender of the patient. But there are far too many ways to express this same common data element. And, and this heterogeneity in the, in the data standards that is used to collect the data um, creates enormous problems in terms of being able to query across data sets, being able to pool and share data, and certainly being able to analyze multiple trials. So this is really anathema when it comes to uh, regulatory convergence. And in fact, when, when we talk to the FDA, our colleagues at the FDA, um, they tell us exactly how this is affecting their regulatory review process. Um, in 2012, the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research at the FDA received about 1,200, almost 1,300 study data sets per week. And if they are submitted in electronic form, each one is about 10 gigabytes in size. They are awash in data. And the extreme variability and unpredictability of data format and content present major obstacles to them in performing timely, consistent, and efficient reviews of the data. And, and they cannot use their sophisticated analytical systems without using standardized data. So these are the words of the FDA. This is a, a slide borrowed from Chuck Cooper um, in CEDAR that he presented at the, uh, the Clinical Data Interchange Standards Consortium European Interchange last year. We cannot improve efficiency or innovate without standards. He's talking about data standards because data management and review preparation consumes about 40% of the regulatory review time, which can um, vary from uh, 12 to 24 months. So that is an enorm would be an enormous savings um, in time and a great increase in efficiency just implementing data standards uh, that remove that problem. And, and in, in in also being able to allow our FDA colleagues to focus on the things that really matter when it comes to market approval. At the present time, without data standards, the emphasis um, it, for them is on data aggregation and analysis and reporting. These are what they call um, doing steps. But with the implementation of data standards, the emphasis would shift onto thinking steps. 
um, and such, such as um, interpretation and, and, and analysis planning and communication and decision making. So it would lead to better regulatory review as well as more efficient regulatory review. And for the trialists themselves, for the drug developers themselves, the use of data standards has been shown in multiple studies to be a tool for efficiency. For, for clinical trials, there is, there's enormous value in using data standards from the start. And in this study by uh, Gartner Consulting, they showed that according, to, uh, as marked against uh, benchmark uh, clinical trials without the use of data standards, um, running comparable trials with data standards implemented from, um, from the start, there can be as much as a 60% savings in analysis and reporting time and a 70 to 90% savings in study conduct and study um, startup times. So this, the use of data standards would be beneficial for the entire community, the developers, the drug developers and the regulators alike. And in fact, in the words of Janet Woodcock, um, she's enumerated on multiple occasions what her view would be of the improvement for the regulators if data standards were to be implemented, improving the efficiency of review, um, as I just stated, but also facilitating the use of sophisticated analytical tools that the FDA is trying to build um, but cannot use with efficiently uh, or at all without data standards, enabling data sharing and pooling, enhancing the ability to perform complex analyses that can give you more accurate determinations on which to base decisions, and, and building a common language um, and a foundation for broader benefits in, in clinical research. So, so the Clinical Path Institute is also invested in data standards. Perforce, um, we are focusing on the therapeutic area or disease-specific data standards that the FDA has announced on their website that they so desperately need. Um, within the next five years. Um, we have uh, formed a coalition with the Clinical Data Interchange Standards Consortium, which is a standards development organization um, that has existed for 12 years and is internationally known for data standards generation used uh, in research and drug development around the world. Uh, we have merged with them to address uh, these 58 disease areas which the FDA um, has uh, publicly announced uh, that it, it is requesting uh, data standards to serve. And I might um, say that these 58 disease areas are not themselves harmonized. If you look at these lists on the CEDAR website, you'll see that one entry will be very specific such as helicobacter pylori gastritis, um, and another entry will be oncology. So, so there may be many more than 58 disease areas um, for which the FDA will really require uh, therapeutic area data standards um, in order to make efficient decisions. Um, and I, I, I might um, tell this audience, an international audience, if you're not familiar with the new law in the United States, the FDA Safety and Innovation Act, so-called FDASIA Act, that was just passed last year, Congress gave the FDA the authority to not only require data standards and require electronic submission um, for market approval applications, um, but to do so um, by 2017. They'll be able to regulate this. And, and the specific section 1136 allows the FDA to require, and this is a direct quote from the law, uh, require standardized fully electronic submissions related to market applications by 2017. And that's why the next five years of data standards generation is so key to the FDA. But it, it may create efficiencies for one regulatory agency requiring standards and implementing them through regulation themselves. But 
Regulatory bodies around the world will then have the added challenge of working within the laws of their country and the laws of other countries, which may restrict their ability to act in concert with one another. So standards could be, in fact, at the, at the uh, epicenter of regulatory convergence, but in fact, there are still hurdles um, to meet um, and challenges to overcome um, if we are to get there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Caroline. This is, this is fascinating. So um, standards help us spend less time on doing, so we have more time for thinking, for which we need clear terms so that we can also communicate what we are thinking about.